tell you a little bit about myself. As I mentioned, I am a physical therapist and have been for, um, we'll say, well over 20 years at this point. Um, I graduated back in the baccalaureate days, so I've been practicing in many different settings. I really enjoy physical therapy. I've worked in every uh, type of facility, going from acute care, ICU, or post-surgical patients, through um, inpatient rehabilitation. I was a physical therapy supervisor of an inpatient rehab unit for individuals, um, primarily with um, neurologic deficits, stroke, head injury, spinal cord injury, as well as amputations and other uh, post-surgical diagnoses. I've practiced in the outpatient setting, both orthopedic and pediatric. Uh, same thing for home care. With peds, I've seen the continuum of care. And then I uh, moved to Florida. So I added skilled nursing and uh, out outpatient and home care geriatric rehab. And then in my second life as a therapist, I went back and obtained my master's in education, specializing in uh, distance education, which lends itself to this format. And I've been an instructor and uh, coordinator of a physical therapist assistant program here in Florida for many, many years. So um, I really enjoy therapy, enjoy educating, and look forward to uh, sharing some of my experiences and uh, research knowledge with you today for our webinar. So that takes care of all that housekeeping type of information. And now we will uh, move on to our content. So again, at any time, uh, if a question pops into your mind, feel free to uh, type it up there and I will get to it during one of our breaks. Today we're going to talk about um, office ergonomics. We're going to look at what contributes to the development of musculoskeletal disorders in the uh, office environment and the setup of our workstations. We'll look at various assessment tools that we can utilize to evaluate the risk factors for our patients. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time discussing how do we modify the work environment to minimize the risk of injury and then also allow the individual to recover from those musculoskeletal deficits that we're treating. This type of course, um, while I complete a lot of research, uh, for every course I develop, I read over 50, 60 research studies on whatever the topic may be. And I tend to look at research beyond just physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, research into other, for this one, uh, engineering journals, some national uh, journals on ergonomics. So try to pull in some different research research because I know as clinicians we're spending our time treating patients so you all don't have as much time as you would like to be out there reading the different studies. So I do that for you and then pull it all together into a uh, cohesive course kind of hitting the highlights. Uh, if those of you that are interested in reading the research studies I find them very interesting. Um, everything that I utilize is listed in my reference section and I always utilize journals that, and specifically articles that are out there for free somewhere on the internet. So if you do want to go and read them a little bit more in depth, those are definitely available to you. And the links are included. Our objectives for today are uh, aligned with our, our course intent, pretty straightforward, looking at uh, defining ergonomics, assessing it, and then how to modify our work environment. And we'll talk a little bit about how do we implement education programs also for our workers. As with any course that you're attending, application of the techniques that you are learning and the information presented is going to be in line with your uh, state, federal, and other professional regulations following your practice act. So the knowledge is imparted to you to apply as you feel appropriate within those guidelines. And that brings us to our actual content now. So we're going to look at ergonomics. And ergonomics, as we're discussing it, is going to be the focus is looking at arranging the work environment to allow the, to design it and set it up in a way that's going to allow the people 
that are working with the equipment and the technology and the devices in order to most effectively utilize them to be efficient and safe in their interactions, which seems to make sense and be pretty straightforward, but there's a lot that goes into planning and assessing that. And what I want you to consider, even though the topic of this course is office ergonomics, the, the office part is non-traditional for many workers at this point in time. So in addition to those individuals that are in a typical, you know, they walk into the office and they have a desktop computer and a workstation, I want you to consider your workers that may be in other types of settings. For example, if they are a dental hygienist or a dentist and they're out in the clinic and they're electronically entering the patient's information, or even yourselves, you'll be able to pull information away from this course that many of you are utilizing um, electronic documentation, so you have some type of portable device. Uh, we also see individuals, when I see the um, delivery companies coming in, or I'm at the grocery store and I see them on their laptops or tablets, and they're in these awkward postures, uh, balancing on boxes and even out in the elements if someone is on a construction site or in a trailer or a mobile work environment. So we're going to try and pull uh, the basics of office ergonomics and how things should be set up. But I want you to consider these other non-traditional environments also, because for many of your patients that are coming to us with different pathologies, even if it wasn't an on-the-job type of injury, they are still working. And the stress that's placed on their various joints because of their work environment and ergonomics may be limiting their recovery from whatever pathology you're rehabilitating them for. So we want to bear that in mind. Also, you should walk away today with many different ideas if you have the opportunity to do consultation or community education that you can look at preventative strategies for um, many individuals. So we'll look at different settings that you can apply this information to. OSHA is our organization, the Occupational Safety um, and Health Act. It was implemented over 45 years ago by the government, and their goal with OSHA regulations was to try and recognize potential hazards in the workplace and try to limit them to decrease the risk of injury for individuals. They have many very specific standards and guidelines out there for safety in different types of factories and environmental settings and things of that nature. But if we look at the number of injuries that are still occurring out in the workplace, if we look at all the different types of work settings that exist, there's still approximately 3 million workplace injuries every year. Officer setting really is a very, very small percentage of that statistic, but for the population that many of us are working with, the office environment is the setting that they're working in. And we need to consider that, the, again, those stresses that they're encountering could be playing a role either in the development or the limitation of their ability to rehab from their injury, whether it's their shoulder, their back, their ankle, um, whatever region you're working with. There was an interesting study in 2014, so a lot of the research is recent, and they looked at an IT company in uh, India with 1,200 employees were surveyed, and they completed office ergonomic assessments. Now, you would think an IT company, right, when they're designing their work environment, one of their first thoughts would be, the setup of the workplace and allowing the worker to be most effective so that they're productive, they're alert, they're attentive, because we know that all comes into play. Well, when they looked at evaluating these various work computer workstations, they used a self-assessment tool where the worker went through and completed it, and we'll look at what some of those are. But they found that of these standard things that should be in place in the work environment, they looked at workers who were around 24 years old, so it was an IT company, younger population, tech savvy. Um, they found that over 50% of them in this youthful population reported that they had painful days at least a couple of times a year. So for a young, healthy population, that's pretty significant. And of those individuals, well, they said, okay, so you have pain a couple times a year. 
all right, that happens. They looked more closely and they found that 54% of them said that that pain lasted for months and that it started to interfere with their work and their ability to participate in their work. And then 23% of those individuals said, well, you know what, I can definitely say because of these aches and pains that I'm having, my productivity was decreased. So that's pretty significant when we're looking at, in general, a young, healthy population at a company that you would think is on the forefront, uh, and the company wasn't named, um, of technology. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today we would think is common sense, but whether or not that's implemented is where we have a great opportunity. And even for ourselves, we're going to find out that many of you may go into work for tomorrow for yourself and find that there are things that you need, need to modify in order to interact better and avoid potential injury. Work-related musculoskeletal disorders are what we are focusing on limiting the development of. And these um, MSDs, as they're referred to by OSHA, are going to be those 10 types of pathologies that we see develop in individuals from overuse type of syndromes, maybe just a pain pattern, tendinitis, herniated disc, pinched nerves. Those are the types of things that are going to be tracked by OSHA in terms of being work-related type of injuries. And it's interesting that OSHA did find a trend in the development of these pathologies in workers because of their attempts to interact with their computer stations. So in 2000, they put out this huge 600-page document that really analyzed the problem that they felt existed. They looked at, um, well, how should we be assessing the workplace? Um, what types of modifications are necessary? And it's a fabulous document. And I know it's amazing to think that I, I immersed myself in it, but I did. I'm reading and I'm like, wow, this is great, but why am I still seeing so many poorly designed workstations? Well, it turns out that as it went through the approval process, it was um, rescinded, so to speak, uh, and they were unable to really put their full document with the um, penalties in place that they wanted for workers, work employers of workers. And they, the statement when it was uh, not passed through uh, further by the government was that, well, you know what, you can't bring anything else back that looks even similar to this. So strike down for OSHA trying to, you know, do something beneficial for the office population. But what they've done is they put a lot of their resources out there for free and we'll pull from many of them. I'll let you know how to access them. And they said, well, we still think these are the standards. This is what should exist. So we're putting it out there to educate everyone. And again, an opportunity for us to educate not only our patients, but maybe the community and employers if you have those opportunities. And I've had the benefit of participating in some of that as um, a company was developing a new office environment, they requested that I come in and kind of observe their um, setup, give feedback on the new construction so that they can make appropriate modifications. So I was all excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, the company's being proactive. I can get in there. I can tell them, you know, where the desk should be, where the window for customer service should be. Well, I arrive to find out they already completed the construction and all their workers are complaining of pathology because their computer station is set up the way that I am looking at you and their customer service area is up over here to the left so they're like this all day on the computer and the window height started about here so the customer is all the way up that high everything was off but had the opportunity and the company was willing to make some structural modifications we were able to have a positive uh, benefit for those employees so some opportunities that uh, that you can consider in terms of improving the workplace. And the reason this is all important is we see a causal relationship for the development of musculoskeletal disorders. And the injuries that we tend to see are what we in therapy refer to as repetitive trauma, cumulative trauma, overuse type injuries, repetitive strain is another term over the years that, that's been utilized. And there's definitely a combination of factors that goes into the development of these 
types of pathologies. We know that the biomechanical risk factors are a big focus that the environment's not set up appropriately, and we'll look at that. There's another category that's emerging related to workplace injuries in general, and it's the individual risk factors. These are items that are intrinsic to our patients, and it goes along with the trend that we're treating patients holistically. We're not just looking at, oh, their shoulder pathology. We're considering, well, are they also diabetic and they have a decreased um, ability to heal? Maybe they also have COPD, so there is some um, impact on their respiratory respiratory status that compromises their endurance. So now they have decreased muscle endurance as they're attempting to hold a posture. So these individual risk factors are things intrinsic to the individual, their characteristics about them in terms of predisposing factors that increase their risk of developing certain pathologies, or it, it kind of contributes to the development of a secondary pathology. And we're seeing a push in many workplaces. And if there's something that interests you a little bit as I talk about other settings, uh, the next webinar that I do is on workplace injuries. So we get into this mo more in depth. But to give you one linkage that we're seeing, and this might be something to consider, again, looking at managing our patients holistically, is patients with increased BMI, body mass, they're finding there's an increased risk of the development of not only back pathology, but also carpal tunnel syndrome. So if that individual is already at a greater risk of developing carpal tunnel syndrome because of their obesity, well, if we have a workstation where their wrists are at an inappropriate position and the chair does not have them supported combining that, well, now we further increase their risk of carpal tunnel. So we're going to look at a combination and just be aware for your patient of those other risk factors potentially playing a role. Another piece that there's a lot more discussion of in therapy are psychological factors and their contribution to the development of pathology and particularly the perception of pain. And there's that uh, saying that, you know, negativity breeds negativity. Uh, and there is some truth to that in the research, that they're looking at individuals who have the development of pain, and they're finding that individuals who have more of a somatization of their pain, where their mental state is, um, maybe they're in a high stress job. They feel like the employer doesn't support them. They're being overworked. They're just not happy in their job. So all of these negative thoughts tend to lead to a decreased um, sense of well-being. There's a decreased um, psychological, you know, positive aspect to their psychological state. And they're actually finding that there's increased somatization of pain, that that pain the individual has is related to their mental state. Now, it's not a conversion disorder where it's completely, there's nothing going on physically. It's more that that individual is going to perceive the same level of pain or discomfort to a greater degree because of those negative thoughts, that negative self-talk. And as I was reading the research on this, I wondered, is that just something that's happening here in the United States? Is it more of um, a cultural trend, possibly? And I looked at research from the Netherlands, Iran, Nicaragua, kind of went you know, off the beaten path a little bit in the research. And it was very interesting to see that those studies, they also found that where there is an increase, particularly in neck and shoulder pain being reported, that those are the same individuals who report this decreased comfort, decreased satisfaction with work, high worker demands. So it again supports that there's that possibility of a linkage between those psychological factors and the perception of pain. How do we step into that is by educating our patient, letting them know we can't change their job, but maybe we can change certain things about um, how they're reacting to the positioning or the stress or just increasing their awareness so that they can improve or arming them with the tools to modify their workplace or go to their employer and maybe see can they get a little armrest or a cushion pad? Can they get a different mouse? And maybe that will be the push to tap into this psychological piece to give them a little more uh, positive perspective that then we'll have a gain from.
And then biomechanically is where we really spend the majority of our time um, and what we consider kind of the way we tend to think as therapists. That particularly, um, they're, they're really finding epidemiologic consistent data saying that this relationship between repetitive stereotyped movements in awkward postures is going to lead to the development of musculoskeletal disorder. And we know this, we're aware of it. And the aspect that you may not think of is beyond the awkward postures of the computer screen not being the right height or the right distance from the individual. Think of those other factors. Think about cold temperatures. Um, those of you, um, who are looking at, and I see questions coming in, and I promise I will get to them during uh, during our breaks. Um, so think about cold temperatures. For example, in my setup here, I have my air conditioning going. Like I said, I was in Florida. Well, the way it's blowing, it was blowing on um, my arm. And I felt, you know, some numbness, tingling in my arm, more likely because I'm cold, I'm tensing, I'm changing my positioning, and I was resting more on that carpal tunnel, and then resting my elbow more on the edge of the table gave a little cubital tunnel compression, leading to the discomfort. So all of that just in reaction to the cold. So slap on a sweater, adjust the air. Also, what we tend to see with colder temperatures is that we have more of what's called a body reaction. Body reaction, and that's an OSHA term um, that leads to the development of injuries. When we're cold, because our sensation changes, we tend to misjudge the amount of force that's being applied. So those of you that are on um, electronic devices where you're holding or supporting it, pay attention now to how hard are you squeezing or holding that device because you're probably holding it and squeezing a lot harder than you need to to support the device. See if you could just lighten up your grasp. And now consider holding that phone, holding that mouse, whatever it may be in the workplace, every small instance where maybe a worker's distracted or because of a temperature change, they're increasing the amount of force that they're applying to an area. That places more stress on the tendons. It creates uh, tissue ischemia. And now we have more of the risk of developing a pathology or that pathology that they already have not healing as well. Maybe we're, they're throwing themselves back into that acute inflammatory process. So that's where these forceful exertions come in that we may not really think of in the workplace. It's not big, heavy manual lifting. It could be a lower grade force just sustained over a prolonged period of time that leads to the development of, of a pathology. And the phone is a big one. Usually when I say that, there's at least one person that'll come back to me later in the course and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, you know, I was compressing my vasculature. I finally saw my capillaries refill when I released my grasp on the phone. So, so be aware of that. Awkward postures um, that can be just from the positioning of an individual is going to lead to uh, the development of increased lever arms if something's too far away and they're trying to hold or grasp that mouse or that portable device. Um, we want to be aware of localized pressure from, like I said, body parts resting on a particular area. The big aspect with positioning that we'll look at is if the screen and the um, mouse and the keyboard are not the appropriate distance away from the patient, then they're going to need to hold their extremities. And this increases the lever arm because we know the further away the, the body, the hand is from the body, whatever we're holding becomes exponentially heavier. That's going to increase shoulder strain with substitutions and compensations further up the chain in the upper trapezius, the scapular muscles, and then we have that ripple effect occurring. So we need to be aware that substitutions and compensations are going to occur for the body to maintain itself against gravity if the equipment is not placed appropriately. Excessive repetition, if I told you that your patient's a hairdresser and has developed lateral epicondylitis, you would immediately connect, well, okay, they're cutting and they're moving and they're 
rep repetitively, you know, greater than in a 30 second interval or cycle time, completing the same activity. And that job specialization leads to that. You may not think of your office worker. You should, because think about moving the mouse. Someone who's solely doing data entry is constantly, think about how fast we're typing. Even our hunter and pecker on the keyboard is completing excessive repetition in a period of time. And then consider that even if the individual is not utilizing their computer workstation for 100% of their day, maybe it's only 25 or 30% of their day, if the ergonomics are off, Combine that with the fact that, well, what is that office worker engaging in when they're not on the computer? Are they filing? Are they a banker and counting money? Are they stapling or hole punching? All those activities are going to utilize the same muscles. So again, connecting the dots for our patients and looking at the carryover for them is going to be something for us to consider. As I mentioned, those forceful exertions can lead to tissue ischemia, particularly if we're looking at grasp force, sharp edges on a stapler. What happens when we have something that gives excessive compressive force, particularly in the palm of the hand? We're looking at the fact that those tendon sheaths may become irritated just because we're compressing on those tendons. But also, we have those small intrinsic muscles of the hands, and our OTs will appreciate that. All of our lumbricals, our inner CI and those thenar and hypothenar muscles, the compressive force on them as we're having them contract could lead to the development of tissue ischemia and then lead to that inflammatory process, decreased blood flow, decreased nerve conduction, and now we're in that vicious cycle where those factors we said are going to lead to decreased sensation and proprioceptive awareness that may cause the individual to squeeze and hold that mouse tighter again, contributing to the development of that tendinitis or other pathology. So we'll be aware of those factors. And the way that we can assess our patients is by looking at their actual workstation setup. There are many different tools out there that we can utilize to perform the ergonomic analysis of the workplace. And we're going to go through a couple of them so that you have some options of what to utilize for our patients. And the, the way that I've divided them up is into two broad categories. There are the picture-based assessments and then more of the checklist or scaled type score scaled. Um, the picture-based assessments are our Rosa, Rula, and Reba. So I like to say our ladies, <laughs> um, if you need a, a quick way to remember them. Um, and many of you may be utilizing these assessment tools for your other upper extremity or back pathology patients. They're easy to utilize. Um, they're something that you could also have a patient utilize, and then we can use for follow-up. And then we have our more in-depth ones. So what I'm going to do is click over here and I'm going to put up a link to all of the assessment tools so that you have access to them um, for the future. They are out there on the internet. So let me cut and paste my link here uh, so that I can give you those tools. I'll pop it up in the window. And there are links to all these assessment tools so that you have it, but I am going to go through each one and we will give you a brief summary of it. The first tool is looking at the ROSA. And for all of the tools that I'm discussing, uh, there has been a sensitivity analysis and testing of them in order to show that they are consistent in their ability to assess the risk of injury. And that's what we're looking at. So the ROSA is our first assessment. And this particular tool, let me show you a picture of it here. This is our ROSA. It's a picture-based relatively simple to utilize, and it's going to promote modification. I like this one, and I suggest it first, uh, the rapid office strain assessment, because it uses a combination of layman's and clinical terminology. So for example, in the first uh, segment of it, you're looking at the um, seat. And when we look at the seat height, it's going to say, well, are you sitting at, are your knees above your hips or below your hips or at your hips? 
but then it'll also say what's the hip angle greater than 90 less than 90 so it's using a combination of both clinic clinician and patient terminology so you could even give this to your patient to utilize and kind of check themselves off with and um, that way they found that when they utilize this tool uh, that there was really strong inter and intra tester reliability so that means between the same individual completing it multiple times as well as other testers in terms of the um, ability to come up with the same data. And then they took the research a step further and they were able to correlate the um, scores on this assessment tool where it indicated that an individual needs uh, changes to their environment. They correlated that to the individual's uh, pain discomfort levels and they found that it was accurate in assessing that. So this is a, a tool that we can utilize. And again, it'll show the individual for the arm position, for the head position, for the wrist position. Um, it assesses each one to see where is it compared to what the accepted position is that we'll talk about later and then we calculate a score for the individual and when we're scoring this out it's going to oops sorry wrong screen there uh, when we're scoring out that uh, Rosa we're looking at any score that becomes a five or higher tells us it's an action level that means it's something where we need to look at modifying that portion of the task or modifying the components of the setup in order to decrease the risk of injury for the individual and then our next assessment tool is our RULA. And the RULA is the rapid upper limb assessment. And this is one more commonly utilized for other um, upper extremity involvement. And the RULA is going to look at not only the position that a joint is in, but it'll take it a step further and it's actually going to consider the posture and the task. So our RULA is going to look again at the posture of the upper extremity where it is, let's say, for example, in ranges of flexion, but it's additionally going to consider the muscle activity. And this is important when we're looking at our task analysis because how long a task is performed for in terms of holding yourself in a posture even at a workstation is going to play a role in uh, the fatigue development, the postural compensations. So a small variability in the keyboard being too far away, but then the fact that the individual needs to be in that position for a total of you know six hours a day, that can lead to muscle fatigue and pathology. And the RULA is interesting because it was developed by an ergonomist in um, England. So I think that's why they added the these additional pieces, the understanding that connection. So we're looking at a, an awareness of those external loads and forces. So there's a scale added to the positioning for that and also for how the contraction is sustained. Because we know sustained contractions not only lead to muscle fatigue, but also tissue ischemia. So it takes this into account as well as the repetitions that are performed of a movement. So when we're scoring out the RULA, let me click over here. When we score out the RULA, it'll range from like a one to two score, which is considered an acceptable score. That means that there may be an awkward single body posture in there, um, but it, if it's not sustained for too long, the individual shouldn't have a problem goes up from there up to a level seven in terms of your points. And that means that there's an immediate risk of injury and everything uh, should be assessed and modified. And again, this is going to look at the head position because we know it increases as there's more cervical flexion if that screen is not at the appropriate height. So that's an important one for the entire extremity. The REBA is our next tool and the REBA is the Rapid Entire Body Assessment. REBA and RULA, they have found that there is um, positive reliability between the two of them, that they are very closely linked. Um, you may decide when you're deciding which tools to utilize that you would use one or the other because they are assessing very similar um, aspects of the posture and the um, ergonomics. 
the main difference is the RULA and the REBA. The RULA, as I said, this, I'll click over to that. The RULA is looking at the upper body positioning, head and neck. And then REBA is going to add to that similar assessment where we're looking at head position, arm position. It's a little more complicated mathematically. And what's added is it's going to look at the lower extremity positioning. And then it's also going to consider external stability and load. So if you had that individual who is working maybe at a construction site or they're a delivery individual, where you're going to try and pull some of the pieces of our ergonomics we'll talk about, but they have that variability of maybe an unstable posture um, where their trunk flexion may be varied, which will place lumbar strain and increase upper extremity load. It's going to look a little more specifically at the type of grip and coupling that the individual has on the piece of equipment they're interacting with. So on that laptop or ourselves, even on that portable keyboard, are we balanced on a mat table or are we standing and holding it at bedside or in home care? This tool may get give a little more information looking at not only the positioning of the extremities in the head and the neck, but again, looking at grip and the posture and stability where those other variabilities can come in. So it's just another tool that we can utilize. And when we look at our scoring for our REBA, The scoring for the REBA is going to be similar, giving us an escalating level in terms of our necessary uh, steps to take and what changes need to be implemented from one being really low or no risk all the way up to a very high risk. These picture-based tools, the three of them, are beneficial because we can have the patient assessed, we can educate them on modifications, have them implement it, and then maybe wait a week or two and have them reassess in order to see if there's been an improvement and if there's been carry through. And some unique ideas on how we can utilize these tools in terms of assessment, it's very difficult. I mean, I come from the days in therapy, and some of you may be with me. We used to be able to go out and do workplace assessments, home assessments. If we were gone for two hours and we had to really could prove the benefit for that patient, it wasn't a problem. Nowadays, there are a lot more restrictions on our time in those types of assessment, but the plus, so we can't do them in the same way. The plus is we have technology now. So you could even think about if you, um, want to be the one to assess that patient while they're sitting in their workplace, you could have them sit at their workstation, have someone else take pictures of them and let the patient bring it in and then you could score out the assessment. There have been some studies out there where they had individuals participate in telehealth type of assessments. So maybe you're using um, you know, video conferencing, I, I don't want to advertise any particular brand, but maybe your phone has it built in where you could be live like this over the phone. Well, you could have someone on the phone, uh, you know, a coworker showing you the patient as they're sitting in their workplace and you could be completing the assessment. And they've actually shown that those um, type of assessments, you can achieve the same data as if you were in person. So some interesting ideas of how you could gather this data and information on your patient, as opposed to just using their verbal feedback, you can maybe have images sent to you somehow so that you could be the one completing the assessment to make sure it's accurate. So those would be for our picture-based assessment tools. Then we also have um, our more written type of tools. And one of them that I found interesting was the um, draft ergonomic practice checklist. And this checklist excited me because it's developed by um, a team of experts that included physical therapists, orthopedic surgeons, psychiatrists. So they had the psychological um, component. And this was actually um, from 2012. It was developed in India and it was published in the International Journal of Rehab. So 
so it pulled from many different aspects and India being a country where technology is significantly utilized, they looked at um, the working posture of the individual and then took it to the next step and looked at the equipment. So those first three tools that we talked about, it looked at the computer screen and other aspects, but this checklist tool is actually that. It's a checklist. It's like a yes, no type of tool for the individual. And let's see if I can zoom in here for you. Um, so it's like a, a yes, no type of tool, like is the head and neck upright? Are the shoulders and arms perpendicular to the ground and parallel, you know, is the forearm parallel to the chair and the, and the surface? And it's a yes, no. And what they did in developing this tool, they tried to pick the key components that would be beneficial um, to really let us know if the environment is set up ergonomically appropriate. And the reason it's still draft is they tested the um, validity and content reliability before they're distributed it. So they found that it is um, reliable and valid among different users and uh, that's what makes it very helpful. And it's a nice easy checklist that can be utilized that you could almost give a patient and have them go down and check it off or have someone else check it off for them. So picking up now on some other assessment tools, the Finnish method, which is it was developed in, in Finland, is an assessment tool that you are more likely to utilize once you're a little more experienced in the types of assessments. It's, I, I find that um, it was suggested to utilize this particular assessment tool when you're working with those non-traditional workspaces or when you just want to be a little more in depth with your assessments. Um, what we do with the finish method is you can look, it gives you the opportunity to do more of a narrative type of format. It doesn't guide you as much. And you pick out the aspects of the environment, postures, things like that that you want to look at. And then you do a little more of a narrative assessment and prioritize the information uh, and it was it still guides you a little bit but not as much as the others and it was interesting in 2014 the this particular tool was utilized to assess an um, a power distribution plant so it was a unique environment where they needed to consider the awkward postures a little bit more um, noise as a factor in terms of being distracting and leading to muscle tension um, temperature in terms of temperature that's too warm contributing to increased muscle fatigue and postural deviations or um, areas of the plant that were too cold where it was leading to that decreased sensation for the patients. So this type of ergonomic assessment opened up a little bit more of a discussion and it was interesting because what they found is in 11% of the cases of the individuals they surveyed at this one plant that none of the ergonomic aspects that we're bringing up were even considered. So that's a significant population and then when they looked more closely at it they found that in 31% of the cases the lighting was off and that was a primary contributor contributing factor for then a ripple effect of um, issues. 42%, it was a temperature issue contributing to the development of musculoskeletal pathology. So interesting things that can come out of this type of analysis and the finished method has you look at those a little bit more compared to some of the um, other tools, ability to accomplish that. The Rogers uh, muscle fatigue analysis. Rogers takes into effect that the um, rapid fatigue is more likely to lead to injury susceptibility. So if a muscle group is fatiguing, it's unable to perform its function as we know, and it'll lead to postural instability, um, potential for injury, substitutions, compensations, uh, things of that nature that place the individual at risk. So this is again a chart type tool where you'll assess different body regions and you'll pick like a specific posture or activity that the individual engages in and then assess the entire body related to that. It additionally, because it's a fatigue analysis, it's going to look at, well, how long is a particular posture or position held, whether it's of the hand, the neck, the arm, how long is that single effort sustained, looking at a range of something sustained less than six seconds, we're not having as much concern about, versus something that's sustained for greater than 30 seconds, and then how frequently is that same 
activity repeated. So if someone is needing to, um, you know, hold the mouse, well, are they clenching it for, you know, less than six seconds? Great, that's not a problem. But if they're doing that for over 30 minutes sustained, well, now combining those two factors, it's something we need to consider where muscle fatigue can develop. So it's looking at those factors a little bit more for the development of our musculoskeletal pathology and helps us prioritize where we specifically should look for our modifications for the individual. The ACGIH hand HAL TLV. Everybody wanted their initial in this. Um, and if you're curious, this tool comes from the American Conference um, on Governmental Industrial Hygienists, who even knew they existed, but I discovered them in my research. Um, and it's actually a very interesting tool. It looks at the hand activity level, so particular occupational therapists may be interested in this. And it looks at a threshold limiting value. So what this tool considers is looking at the hand and forearm in particular and the repetition of activities. So not only for office ergonomics with typing and computers, but you might want to consider using this for, um, you know, even if it is your individual who for hobby participates in kind of like a fine motor, um, knitting, crocheting, something of that nature, or individuals in professions, maybe they're assembly line workers or different types of fine motor type of things. What this tool is going to assess, and it makes sense when you think about it, um, it uses a Borg scale, so a perceived exertion scale, to look at the intensity of the peak force that they're utilizing of the hand. Um, and then it's usually a visual analog scale to look at how often is that being repeated. And it creates a chart where you're going to look at, and it has a threshold value. It's saying, okay, well, if someone is using a small force, but for a prolonged period of time, they could be at the same risk as someone using a strong force, but less frequently. So your individual who is a um, you know, machine operator could be at the same risk of injury as your individual who is that hairdresser because it's a light force, but frequent. So this tool can help direct where to look at modifications for the, those individuals particularly related to the hand. And then our last tool is the strain index. This tool is going to consider potential risk factors. It will take into account the um, posture, fatigue, repetition, so the same factors that we have been discussing. And then it also looks at the speed of the movement and recovery time. So it's adding a couple of more factors into our consideration. It will again be a useful tool to look at the uh, speed of the work, focusing more so on the hand and strain in the hand, combining um, grasping considerations, um, looking at the spe specifics of the wrist position for the individual, and then this will again come up with a score that'll put you in a range of where activity modification or environmental factor modification needs to occur to decrease that risk of injury um, for the patient. So it's probably safe if it's less than three and then escalating into potentially hazardous increasing the risk of injury. The strain index uh, requires a little bit more of a mathematical calculation, so you would need to determine if that's beneficial to select this tool versus one of the others. Again, it'll be a little more specific to the hand.
have a lot of different tools that we can utilize to gather information to assess our patients. And what's important when we're looking at implementing modifications based on this information is that in terms of organizational processes, if you have that opportunity to work with the organizations, is that the research is really showing that if there are changes in the environment and administrative and workplace factors, that they can see positive changes in the risk of injury. Um, they can see improvement in productivity for individuals, and when employers are looking at an ergonomic program, they really have to think about those engineering controls or modifications to the physical work environment. And I have here the link to the OSHA guidelines that I mentioned earlier. And OSHA's philosophy has that they're putting out there is currently that they should design the job to fit the worker rather than for physically forcing the worker's body to fit the job. And if you're short like me, that <laughs> you live that every day, right? You walk in somewhere and something's not at the appropriate height, and you can imagine if you had to work with that every day, constantly reaching or moving out of your work, your comfort zone, that can lead to stress and strain on the body. So the push and the reason you're all here is recognizing the need to make those modifications. Another important piece are the administrative controls. They found that employers can change environments, but if they don't change procedures and philosophies, then you don't have the most benefit. For example, we know that related to that fatigue risk and injury risk, that there needs to be rest time built in. So employers need to look at their policies and procedures on rest breaks. Are employees actually utilizing them? When you're having your um, patient return to work and you're talking to them about, oh, they need to stretch in between and things like that, well, are they actually taking those breaks when they should? And could that be a factor that's contributing? It doesn't mean you're superseding the company policy. But if the how many of you, you know, you work through lunch because you need to get your documentation done. Well, your body may need some of that rest in order to truly be productive. So consider that with our patients that we need to also look at for our patients when they are in rehab. If that psychological piece is a component for them where they feel you know that those that negative self-talk aspects are contributing to their pain and somatization of it and their difficulty with rehabbing maybe is there an opportunity at their job to serve on a committee to give feedback on the workplace so is there an opportunity at a job for someone to be a floater we're seeing a lot of the push with specificity in job skills where there's not as much cross training that that's leading to greater risk of injury because people are just repeating the same activities. So maybe consider talking to your patients about sequencing their activities so that one muscle group is having a break. So maybe they don't come in in the morning and spend you know, two hours returning all their emails first. Is it an option? Spend a half hour on emails, now go to the phone, return some phone calls then come back to the emails. So some of this and educating our patients to understand, you know, the, the shifting of the stress on the different muscle groups so that we can have a better rehab for them.
also consider if they need to be wearing personal protective equipment. We automatically think of infection control with that, right? In different um, jobs, there's different PPE. Someone who's a dental hygienist, they have on the, the um, goggles and the gloves. Well, that's going to decrease the proprioceptive and sensory feedback as they're trying to type on the computer. Maybe you need to change the sensitivity of their mouse to be more sensitive so they don't have to work as hard to move it. Maybe you need to talk about them about where to put that computer screen versus their stool versus their patient. Or consider the glare. Maybe just lowering the light because those goggles are going to give more glare and reflection, reflection sorry, on the screen. Maybe just lowering the light a little will decrease the eye strain. If it decreases the eye strain, that'll, they won't need to go into that forward head posture as much. That won't change the loading on the cervical spine and then that ripple effect. So we have small modifications that we can maybe make for our patients that will have significant benefits for them. As I mentioned, worker self-assessment uh, can be beneficial, that we can look at having them complete these assessments and bringing the information back to us to give us an idea of where to guide. And there's actually the USDA. I think I want this job at some point. It is a great program that they have where if they go on their website, um, they anyone that works for USDA can put in a request to have an ergonomic assessment and they do like a telehealth remote assessment for them to modify their workstation to increase productivity. I think that's fabulous. Since we all don't have the benefit of that for ourselves and our uh, patients, OSHA provides an online assessment tool and workplace uh, checklist that might be something you can consider having your patients utilize if you don't wanna go to one of those OSHA, uh, those um, ROSA or other tools that we spoke of. This checklist is a little more user-friendly and, e and easier for a patient to understand. So what do we actually want the workstation to look at? And how should it physically be set up? That's what we're going to spend our next block of time um, speaking of. And what we need to consider is the space itself. Many workers are in a shared space, so we need to have them educated on how to modify it every time that they come in. I know for myself, it's crazy. When I, rare occasions, I do get to take lunch, like many of you. I go into the conference room, or if I go in for a meeting, I sit down, and I'm the only person that's adjusting the chair height. Because I'll sit down, and you know, the table up to here on me. Well, I'm not going to sit and take my notes like this. I want to be up and appropriate, so I'm constantly adjusting the hair, chair height in the back. It's become second nature um, for me. We want it to be that way for our patients so that they're aware, particularly if they're in a shared workstation. Also consider that if the individual is using a laptop and they're trying to turn it into a desktop, uh, which I did, I thought uh, a couple of years ago, I'm like, I'm going to get a laptop, that way I can have my computer with me no matter where I am. Well, once I added all the peripherals I needed to have it function as, you know, in my physical desk, there was too much clutter, I couldn't get everything the way I needed it, so now I'm back to a desktop computer and I have a separate laptop. So consider that for your patient. What we're going to focus on primarily today is a desktop computer setup, and then you'll be able to translate some of the information over into those more non-traditional workplaces. As a general rule, what we're going to be look at is minimizing the pain spasm cycle that can develop from compensations and substitutions, particularly in the cervical and the back area. Um, we're going to look at our tendinitis, tendinosis, trying to minimize the development of that. And we're going to try and um, maximize our patient's ability to maintain their postures with the least amount of muscle effort and stress in the wrong areas. So we're going to look at many different factors and we will break it down into our seating, our desk and monitor, our peripheral components, and then other environmental office factors that play a role. So we'll kind of go through each one step by step to let you know how to assess them and give you some suggestions. Uh, what I did when developing the PowerPoint for this is I um, stopped by office 
office locations of some of my colleagues and I did drop-ins just kind of on the spot saying, can I take a picture of you just sitting there as is without me asking you to fix anything? Because what happens when we tell our patients we're looking at their posture, you know, they sit up and everything's correct. So uh, I did uh, drop-ins on colleagues and many of them were nice and is nice enough to let me take pictures of them. So we'll look at some actual uh, setups for modification. So let's first start with the seating. First place, right, when we look at the chair specifications. There are many different types of chairs out there. And at minimum, you want the chair to have a five caster base. Some chairs only have the four casters to it. And what they found is if there are less than four legs, this is more prone to tipping and it will require more um, balance then or, or a potential quick response from someone in order to restabilize that chair. Let's say they were reaching over to do filing or if they're trying to wheel it to another area of the office to get something. Um, so you really want a five caster base. And uh, we want to make sure that the controls are easy to reach for the individual. We have so many things that we can adjust on the different chairs, and it takes some time. The first thing I do when I go into an ergonomic assessment, after I look at the individual and get a sense of where they're at, is I'll ask them to get up and out of their chair, and I'll be flipping that chair upside down and looking at the, the controls. I'll sit in it myself. I'll figure out how it moves. What options do I have on it to work with? Um, because sometimes it is hard to figure out and we don't want to compromise our body mechanics you know kind of bending underneath trying to figure out well what do these dials control uh, so we will take a look at the different supports that we have available in the chair first thing to look at is our seat height and how far off of the ground the seat is traditionally we've said that a 90 90 posture like we think of for someone in a wheelchair is the best posture and by 90 90 sitting we mean the feet are flat on the floor the knees are at a 90 degree angle the hips are at a 90 degree angle and the individual is sitting upright that traditionally was the uh, ideal sitting posture what they found over time is that's not the only way to sit and it doesn't really work well for everyone. So there is an option of opening up that hip angle a little bit. So this individual at the top, let me uh, change my marker color here. We can see that their knee is slightly lower than their hip. So they've opened up that hip angle a little bit by declining that seat. And for that individual, it may take some of the stress off the lumbar, lumbar spine. So we can have um, that type of posture for the individual that can be beneficial. We want to have that option of adjusting the uh, seat height so that we can ensure the feet are flat on the floor and so that there is a comfortable positioning for that lumbar, lumbar spine. In general, when you're looking at a chair and the specs for it, if the chair says that it adjusts between 15 and 22 inches in terms of height, that for most individuals gives you a sufficient range so you can get it to the height that they need so that their feet won't be dangling on the floor and you can control that hip angle. So usually, 15 to 22 inch range, and then that it allows a four to five inch adjustment somewhere within there. So that'll allow you to adjust to different patient, patient heights.
A quick adjustment for individuals when they come to their uh, chair, because some of them may not have the dexterity or ability to, you know, lean over, unweight the chair and adjust the height, is when they come in and they stand at the chair, if the seat top is approximately at their knee height, that should put them about where they need to be when they sit down so that their feet will be flat on the floor and we'll have a uh, hip angle here this woman for her it's a little more comfortable to have a little bit more of an open hip angle or she could have the seat a little lower and be closer to that 90 degree angle for myself i utilize this on a daily basis um, because with teaching there are certain days that i'm in the lab so i'm in clinic clothes with flats there are other days that i know i'll be teaching or going to an administrative meeting so i'm in my you know heels and dress so I need to adjust my seat height on a daily basis based on the height of my heels. And I'll use this quick adjustment of coming in, seeing where I am about related to my knee height, and then sit down and adjust the seat height um, appropriately. That's a little shortcut that we can give our patients in order to adjust that seat height. We want to make sure that the feet are flat on the floor. If the seat is too high, the feet will be in plantar flexion. If the seat is too low, like in the bottom picture here, for this gentleman, see how his feet are up on the chair and his knees are in a lot of flexion, uh, as well as his hip. So this seat is way too low for him. So he has his feet up trying to uh, compensate for that. So this posturing for this individual is going to throw off his entire base of support and shift his mechanics. He can even barely get under his desk there. Um, so this is one of those ripple effects, right? He needed the seat low so he can get underneath this keyboard because he's a tall gentleman, um, but now that's throwing off his other mechanics. So this might be an instance where we'd say, well, this under desk keyboard isn't the best choice or for this individual, you know, that keyboard comes up and out. A lot of those um, have a handle on it and a mechanism that it can come up and out. Sometimes we just need to educate our patients on that being, being an option for them. Or possibly for him, it might be an option where his workspace is when he's going to slide under is to the right here that, that's off camera um, where there's a clear space. And then when he needs to be at the computer typing, then he adjusts the seat height and that keyboard appropriately. So, right, we can adjust things as we go along throughout the day based on making it task specific. And we educate our patients that that's important for their overall well-being. This individual sitting at the desk, again, we, do, we have the feet back here flexed all the way behind. So you can imagine that that's putting a significant stress on the lordosis. And uh, we have a significant forward head here with our ripple across the chain. And I can tell you this individual suffers from significant um, cervical pathology as well as um, shoulder pathology. And, you know, seat height would be the first thing I would look at. And then the question becomes, well, why doesn't the person have it at the appropriate height? Because this woman is uh, petite, she has plenty of space, the seat could be up higher at the right height, and you can't see it very well, but she has a ton of clutter under the desk here. So there's no way to put her feet there. Uh, so it's, again, sometimes looking at these simple factors um, will allow us to adjust the seat. She's also scooted very far forward. She's not utilizing this lumbar support on the chair. So that's going to place additional stress on the back. So again, the chair could be great. I actually picked out this chair, and it has everything it needs for this individual. Um, but it's not being utilized. So educating our patients on the need to utilize that lumbar support and have themselves scooted all the way back to take the strain off of their back. When we look at utilizing that lumbar support, the top of the chair is not designed to be the lumbar support. So you see how this individual has the top of the chair all the way down and they're utilizing the top edge as a lumbar support, which is actually creating a kyphosis for them. And then that's creating a forward head posture. It's rounding the shoulders, encroaching in that subacromial space. So now when she reaches up to reach for any of the papers or tools or phone, she's impinging at her shoulder. So 
we need to adjust that and that lumbar support should actually be located in the lumbar region. Uh, that adjusts in different chairs different ways. Some of them have a mechanism so you can actually adjust the height of it kind of like you do um, it, or you add an external pad like you would slide it up or down. You can strap a lumbar support under onto a chair in order to assist the individual in maintaining that proper lordosis for them. We don't want them um, slouching because we need to think about if the individual doesn't have the chair at the right height and their bottom all the way back, that'll change the lordosis and the trunk position that then is going to affect the arm position also and the head. So we need to be aware that we want to maintain a normal lordosis for that patient. For some patients, uh, using a seat recline is beneficial. As I said, that 90-90 sitting isn't the only way to um, sit. What we find is for some individuals opening up this hip angle. So again, here she's sitting semi-reclined. So there's a mechanism. You'll adjust the seat height, but then there's usually another little dial that you'll turn that can let the person recline back a little bit in the chair. And even for yourself, if you're sitting up, you know, we're not that long after the break. I may not have bored you too much yet where you're falling asleep, right? You might still be up and attentive and sitting forward. Well, you know, let yourself just recline back a little bit. You're not slouching, right? You're just opening up that hip angle. And in doing so, what tends to happen is we're decreasing the lumbar strain by, you know, kind of hinging back a little bit and opening that hip angle into that reclining position. And what it does is it shifts the weight of the upper body to the chair as opposed to the lumbar spine. So it'll take some of the stress off of it. So this is a great position. If you only come back slightly, you can still maintain an appropriate um, visual angle with the computer screen. If you recline back too far, then you're flexing your cervical area and kyphosing to reach your keyboard. But if they come back just slightly, it can have that benefit of decreasing that lumbar load but maintaining the eye angle. Something to think about if you use that recline feature, think about shared workspaces. So um, I had an instance where I was uh, adjusting a, a chair for an individual, and I'll tell you, I'm um, kind of petite, I'm 5'2", capped out, and, and I'm not, not very big. Um, I, the ergonomic assessment was on a gentleman who I believe he was 5'11", and very large, we'll say. He was well over 200 pounds, probably closer to three. Um, so I, I had set him up where he was, he was having some cervical pathology, so I taught him how to use the open hip angle to recline the chair back just a little bit, but he went back too far. The way that you control the, the tilting back or the recline on the seat, it's through a tension mechanism. So you adjust the tension so that when you lean your body weight on it, it'll just recline back slightly. So he, you know, had the tension adjusted on the chair and sat, you know, sat in the chair. So I get in the chair to readjust it for him and he's heavier than I am. He did not need as much force to recline back. So he had the tension adjusted. So when he leaned back, that chair went back nice and slowly. Well, I sit in the chair, I'm a third of his size, and I'm trying to adjust the chair. I can't even get it to budge because the tension is so tight. So be aware that for different individuals, it's going to take different amounts of tension. If I shared that workspace with him and I adjusted the tension very, very loose, so it you know didn't take as much force to lean back, when he sat in that chair, he'd almost flip out of it because of his body size. So be aware for your patients in those shared workspaces, how you instruct them and how to adjust that tension. But it is a great feature. This is an example that if someone is reclining too far back, we can see here there's no lordosis 
in the cervical spine because we have that forward head in order to see the computer. Obviously a very old workstation, but the, the picture I liked, it illustrates the point. We're also seeing a um, protraction of the scapula here and uh, rounding of the shoulders in order to reach the keyboard. So too far back um, also is not, not beneficial. And I'd like you to consider your patients with disabilities who are going back into the workplace too, that we wanna maximize these ergonomics so that they can maximize their uh, muscle performance also. Another feature that is frequently uh, available on chairs that many individuals may not be aware of is the seat pan depth. And the seat pan is looking at the base of the chair, and it's the, um, think of when you're doing a wheelchair um, order for a patient, you look at the seat depth. Well, that's the same thing that's available on these chairs, that we can change the distance, kind of slide that seat forward and backward to give more support under those femurs. So particularly if you have individuals who are shorter, you want to make sure you have an adjustable seat pan because if this was too far forward on the femur, it would compress in that popliteal area. We also want to look that this waterfall edge is available. A waterfall edge means that the front edge here is a little bit rounded. So if there is um, pressure, or uh, I should say a proximity to the popliteal area, that waterfall edge with the rounding and the panning is going to decrease the risk of compression to the neurovasculature in that popliteal region. So it won't compromise the flow to that distal lower extremity, particularly if someone's sitting for a long period of time. So that seat pan depth is going to allow you to adjust it. So we have about two to three inches between the edge of the seat and the patient's popliteal area. So just to show you here on this desk chair, so this is with the seat pan is um, all the way forward, so we have the space in here. And then this is with the seat pan all the way back, so someone who has a shorter leg, see how it's more in contact with the back. So this is going to allow you to adjust that patient so that they have the right femoral support. Because we know if the femur is not supported, then it can change the angle of the hip, placing stress on the lumbar spine. So that seat pan angle, to show you an example here, in this individual, he has too much compression on the right-hand side here in that popliteal area. So for this taller, um, individual, we need to adjust that seat pan. He probably should be scooted a little further forward. On the shorter individual, we have that seat pan further back so that there's plenty of space in there. So it can be uh, beneficial in allowing um, limitation of that popliteal compression. And a good guide of how you can let your patient know, well, where where should it be adjusted to or to give them a sense of how much space there should be when they're adjusting it themselves is if they're able to fit their hand between um, the posterior knee and the edge of the seat or um, I use for myself if I'm putting my forearm underneath there if I can fit the width of my forearm um, underneath there for the individual. But for the patient, if they could fit their metacarpals through, through there, uh, that usually gives that two to three inch, inch space. Similar to when we're adjusting those axillary crutches for the individual, if for our guide.
armrests are the next aspect of the chair that we want to take a look at. And armrests are really important that um, I spend a lot of time taking a look at them because many of the postural deviations that occur can be uh, fixed by adjusting the armrests. We need to have the armrests at a sufficient height to support the weight of the upper extremity. We don't want the shoulder to be elevated or depressed too far, but we want to allow the individual to be able to move their arms. Really the goal of the armrest is to let the individual have their good base of support and distribute their weight on their seat and that we want to have it taking up the weight of the upper extremity in order to support it so that the load is taken off the shoulders and the neck area. So that is how um, our armrests should be functioning for the individual. Um, and if we look at awkward postures that can develop when someone is sitting in the chair, so just take a look at this individual. We're looking at a posterior view of someone sitting. And we see that this individual is um, laterally shifted. We can see the increased curvature here um, in for the to try and rest on this armrest here. And this arm is significantly abducted. So we can imagine further up the chain the shiftings that that's occurring. We see increased weight bearing here on the right gluteal and ischial tuberosity region as well as increased weight bearing on the uh, right elbow so that cubital tunnel is at risk. And the problem here is, if many of you haven't already caught it, is that this left arm rest is significantly higher than the right arm rest. So it's creating a functional scoliosis for this patient. It's shifting the upper extremity. So it's almost like the individual shifts their body to fit in the chair versus just change the chair to put your body where it should be. Our goal would be for the um, arms and shoulders to be symmetrically supported. Our elbows should be somewhere between 90 and 100 degrees of flexion, and we want to make sure that's measured with the shoulders being nice um, and relaxed for the individual. When you're purchasing a chair, if you want to know what specs to look for, you should have a chair that allows an arm height adjustment between seven and 10 and a half inches. So an arm height adjustment between seven and 10 and a half inches will give you enough range for most individuals to adjust that height so you can get a good elbow angle and that'll keep that forearm nice and parallel to the floor. The individual sitting here when they're relaxed in this first picture of the woman in pink on the right is the positioning that we want. If the armrests are too high, we're going to see upper cervical, um, upper trap compensation, we're probably compensating them with an additional forward head. If the armrests are additionally too wide, we're going to see an alteration in the posture also. The woman here on the left, one of my drop-ins, um, if we look at her sitting posture, her chair height isn't bad. She's using her lumbar support. In terms of her head, she's got pretty good head alignment there. But what I'm concerned about is here with that cubital tunnel where all that pressure is occurring. Uh, this, these armrests are way too high for her that she's not even utilizing them. So over the course of the day, she is going to start developing fatigue and doesn't have the opportunity to use those armrests. If she did, she would be creating other asymmetries that would lead to pathology. So we just want to lower those armrests down so that she can utilize them appropriately. Armrest width is something else that we can look at, and armrests can be adjusted away or towards the seat in some, and some of them allow pivoting and changing of the angle of the armrest support. So if you have workers who maybe are larger, we need to think about the armrests not compressing the soft tissue of the trunk. So you may need to find armrests that pivot out, might be beneficial, and help to decrease shoulder strain. We want to make sure that that um, cap of the elbow uh, is resting on. So again, this patient has cubital tunnel risk. This armrest should be lower so that the arm can actually be resting on it 
And because he is on his keyboard and his arm is this way, we should try to angle his armrest to actually support that entire forearm. So here's an example of that. The right armrest is pointing straight forward and the left armrest is angled slightly in. And that is going to allow you to adjust that for patients so that the forearm can actually be supported by the armrest. Otherwise, they're going to be holding the weight of that extremity. So for many individuals, even yourself, if you just rest your arms as you would as if you were on a keyboard, you're going to see you come into a little bit of internal rotation. Well, if the chair you're in is too wide for you and you're trying to stay out on those armrests, you may be externally rotated and abducted but you're still trying to lean in to reach the keyboard. So now we're back to, again, all of those classic postural deviations that, that tend to occur that we want to try and avoid. Looking at the monitor height, monitor height should be set so that the individual, when they are looking straight at the monitor, it should be centered in front of them, and they shouldn't have to turn more than 30, 35 degrees to the right or the left in order to scan the entire monitor. If someone has two monitors, which is popular now, we want to again have it so that you know, they're looking to the left and the right, no more than 30 degrees in order to uh, minimize any cervical compensation that might occur. The distance of the monitor is always something that individuals play with. You might even see that for yourself, right? You adjust it forward, you adjust it back. General rule, the references, all are different. I went through so many sources and there was no one number that kept coming up. So the general rule is that it should be somewhere between 18 and 40 inches. Well, that's a big difference. What you have to really come down to is the cervical spine. What you want to make sure is that it should allow the individual to maintain a neutral cervical spine. If it's too far away and they're leaning in or too close and they're retracting back, that's not what we want. So general rule, what you can look at is if someone put their arms out, that's about where the screen should be to give them a loose, loose estimate and then you're going to tweak it from there. What happens is we need to consider that the individual needs to be able to see. So depending on what their uh, vision is, they may or may not be able to focus on the text in order to read it or type it at the distance that works for their cervical spine. So you might need to consider adjusting the size of the text for the individual. So what happens is our eyes are designed so that when we, um, when we're looking at something, if we flex our head down, our eyes tend to focus on small things. When we lift our heads up, then our eyes tend to be more open, alert, and focusing on things far away. Well, think of reading a book, right? You come down and in, and our eyes are going to focus on reading that book. Small text. 
up and out, what are you reading? You're reading a street sign. You're reading a menu board, right? We're reading something further away and we're open and focused on it. If the computer screen is not at the appropriate distance, you're for, if it's too far away, you're forcing your eyes, now they're up, they're trying to look at something far away, but if you have a fall, small text, you're forcing the eyes to use the muscles different to focus. So they're not going to function as well that can increase eye strain, increase headaches, increase cervical strain as they try and see it. So what you need to think about is making adjustments to the um, monitor so that the individual can focus appropriately. So think about the distance, think about the text. Why not just make the text bigger? I can't tell you how many times a day, I'll tell you in the chat room right now that we're using, I upped my font to 22 so that I can actually read what's coming through. I can see maybe two messages at a time, so I'm scrolling a lot, but I can actually see the font, keep my cervical spine where it needs to be, because if it was smaller, I'd be like this trying to read, leading to compensations. So here's a keyboard shortcut that is my favorite, Control plus. Control plus will make a font bigger, Control minus will make a font smaller. You can have your workstation set, and then as the individual goes to different documents or as the day goes on and there's eye fatigue, just make the font bigger. Then they can maintain their alignment. So little tricks and things to um, consider. Looking at the height of the monitor, we want it set so that if we look at the eye level to the top of the monitor, you're going to see, you know, maybe the monitor is about an inch or two below the eye level. That's about you know, 10 to 20 degrees for us if we were physically measuring it. So we wanna have it straight out so we're at, in terms of a height, the top edge is going to be about that 10 to 20 degrees. So you may find for many individuals, you need to take it off the, the, um, the computer itself and put the monitor down. If it's too high, it leads to too much cervical extension. Uh, we want to avoid that. And again, it can contribute to increased eye strain if it's too high, like the individual on the right here. Um, so that is way too high for her. Those suboccipital muscles up top are being strained. That can lead to um, headaches and other, other stress. And then that is going to shift everything up. The gentleman here, his computer is at a good visual height for him. The keyboard is at a good height. And because he's tall, everything's raised up. See, we have this tall arm here raising everything up and a nice high chair for him. So this works. He's a larger gentleman. This is the way he needs things. And that allows him to work effectively and efficiently. Individuals that wear glasses, that changes things slightly. We still want these proportions between the equipment and the individual because biomechanically, we want to decrease uh, the stress and maintain alignment. But we need to think when someone's wearing glasses, particularly bifocals, trifocals, they need to read at a different, out of a different part of the glasses. So what we need to do, particularly for someone with bifocals, is lower that monitor slightly so that when they look at the bottom edge of their glasses, they're seeing the center of their screen. Right. The individual here on the left, oh, where to begin, right? Um, let's see, we're talking about monitor. So here's the top of the monitor, and here's her head. And here's her eyesight. That is a significant angle. We're probably at a 30 degrees extension angle, way too high for her. Look at the seat. She is in significant knee flexion and hip flexion. This is placing increased stress in the posterior femur in the ischial area. Look at the Posterior pelvic tilt here, kyphosis up here, scapular spreading, and the right arm is completely abducted resting up on the table. And the forward head is significant. So where do we start with someone like this? The two big things that would jump at me first, I would adjust seat height 
And then that would lead me to maybe find that the computer may be at an okay height. It just might be that for whatever reason she lowered her computer, her, her seat down, and then she lowered her keyboard down. So you pick one thing and adjust it. I would sit her up higher, adjust the seat pan, adjust the recline and the lumbar support, get her sitting the way she should in the chair, and then add on the other components to work on it. Monitor tilt is something else that we can adjust. So that's kind of like on your laptop where you adjust it forward and back. If we give um, a little bit of a tilting down of the monitor, we're going to see that it's going to help decrease the uh, glare that's occurring. So tilting is when we kind of tip that front part away from us. So if we um, adjust that tilt, it can help keep an equal focal length for our eyes in order for scanning and reading pages. So we're going to um, look at decreasing glare. If we tilt it a little more forward, it can take some of that um, glare off for the individual. And then screen colors are something else to think about. Way back when, when we started with computers, it was a black screen with green lettering. I am totally dating myself. Um, and we used ones and zeros for computer programming. Um, amazing how far we have come. You could be in the middle of the ocean watching uh, a movie now. Uh, but think about adjusting that for your patient, that maybe that adjusting the contrast will help change the um, effort needed for visual focusing and can help them become uh, have less eye strain and then that'll decrease the stress on the neck and kind of that ripple effect further down the chain. So those are some of the components that we can look at in terms of the chair and the monitor. And we're going to pick up with lighting, which is something interesting. And I'll tell you, um, the room that I'm using as my office now, uh, it's kind of like a dual purpose, like many of you. And we painted it this bright yellow, nice and bright and fun and airy. And we have a huge window. It is the worst place to be doing these webinars um, between the screen glare and the heat temperature changes and things like that. Um, so if you have the opportunity, your patient has a home office and they can make some modifications, uh, these are some of the things we're going to talk about now. Even if they're in a general um, office type of setting, you definitely want to consider lighting. And it's very interesting. There's actually an illuminating engineering society and they have put out uh, very specific guidelines on what is acceptable office lighting and how to modify it. And the key here is the connection between glare and eye strain. So what they say is that the more natural light that you can have, the better. So that's beneficial, but we have to look where that natural light is positioned based to our computer screen in order to minimize um, our glare. Because that reflected image coming back is going to place additional strain on the eyes that will again lead to uh, changes in functioning and really what 
ultimately all this comes down to is decreased productivity and the development of pain and pathology for individuals. Also with lighting, I want you to remember that psychological piece, that you know a dark, gloomy environment is not productive, but something that's too bright and glaring can also lead to um, fatigue for the individual. So think about using window treatments if a room is too bright. They actually make these um, egg crate type covers that can go over fluorescent lighting to try and minimize the um, reaction from them. Looking at where to place a monitor, if we look at this individual, she has this huge window here that gets a lot of exposure. So her monitors are going to be placed perpendicular to those windows in order to um, minimize the glare. So they're at a right angle so that that sun isn't beating right in or beating from behind right in on her eyes. So that'll help um, control the glare for her. What they say in terms of blinds, just the type of blinds that's on the window for when you close it can make a huge difference in the amount of light that comes through. So if a window has an east-west exposure, it should have a vertical blind on it. So east-west exposure, vertical blinds will block the light better. And if there is a north-south exposure, then a horizontal um, blind or a Venetian type of blind is going to be more, more effective. So that's something that can make a huge difference in the amount of light that is entering, entering the room. The ambient lighting, looking at the ceiling lights, as I mentioned, we want to look at where they are placed. I'm probably the only person except for anyone who's attended this course, that when I enter the gym with my iPad, the rare occasions I finally get there to hop on the elliptical, I walk in like this to pick my elliptical. You know, out of the 20, I look at the lights because it has all the, the lights going this way, right? Well, I'm going to put my iPad down, and if it's making a glare from the reflection when I'm trying to work out, looking for any excuse to stop, by the way, you know, if I constantly see the reflection of that light and it changes my eye strain and my head position, I know that'll create pain. But it's a good excuse to leave, too. <laughs> um, but we want to look that the way the lighting is placed, we want it to be have the monitors, again, at right angles to those different light sources. And we might want to use some create crate or covering or something to minimize those um, lights. And the way that you can tell if the external lighting is too much, the goal would be to have the brightness of the screen equal the brightness of the surrounding area. We can change the external lighting, the window lighting, or the screen brightness to accomplish that. It'll be a mix for everybody. But here's how you know if it's too much, and try this for yourself now. If you, you know, put your hand over your eyes like you're looking at the horizon. If you're looking at your computer screen, and you put your hands over, and you immediately feel your eyes kind of start to relax, and then when you take it away, if you kind of feel like you have to strain your eyes, that means that external lighting, either the natural or ambient light, is too bright. It's brighter than your screen. So if this gives relief, you need to decrease that external lighting. So a quick little uh, check that you can give your patients there as a guide. Glare is something else that we said we're going to be cautious of. If nothing else works, paint color, as I mentioned, a medium tone, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could all go into work to get tomorrow and say, oh, you have to paint this office. It needs to be a lighter shade for me. May not be an option, but if someone's looking at setting up a home office, or again, you're in the, the front end of things, might be a recommendation. Um, and when in, nothing else works, they do make screens that can go on to diminish the glare for an individual. Keyboard position is something else we need to be attentive to. The QWERTY part of the keyboard, for those of you that that's new uh, terminology, the QWERTY part is the letter part of the keyboard. So sometimes we have the keyboard with the letter part and then the number pad is separate. You want that QWERTY part where the person's usually typing most from to be what's centered in front of them. And then the number pad 
could be a little off to the side. Um, for this individual here, looking at his uh, setup, there are a multitude of things wrong. Um, but first, let's take a look at his keyboard. Um, when we look at the keyboard positioning, his keyboard, see how he has it angled up here? He actually took it off the tray and put it up on the desk despite my recommendation not to do that. Um, again, drop by photo. <laughs> um, his chair he kept appropriate. Armrests should be up a little higher. Um, but if you look, this elevation of the keyboard gave him a lot of wrist extension, which is going to stress the carpal tunnel. And it's also going to change uh, the length tension relationship of the wrist extensors, so leading to that potential lateral um, epicondylitis. His screen height, he's a tall man, you can't see his head here, but his screen height's okay. It's just that keyboard being off. And every time I explain why it should be down and he puts it down and everything's fine, a couple weeks later it comes to me with increased cervical pain, wrist pain, because we have that ripple effect. So what I ended up doing was taking a look at him um, in, sorry, let me go back here, in terms of taking multiple shots when I took the pictures. And as I flipped through the pictures, what I found is when he types, he's a hunter and pecker. And I never noticed it, kicking myself, because I was always doing static assessments. So when I watched him over time, we'd have everything right, he needed to see the keys to type. So when I kept telling him not to do the forward head and the kyphosis because he has back pathology initially, he didn't want to do that. He's like, I'm doing everything right here. So we moved the keyboard up so he could see to type. Didn't even think of it. So we needed to do some other modifications to account for that because we changed back pathology into a potential wrist pathology. Um, so just think about that. You want to look at that keyboard positioning as well as the keyboard height of the individual. Your goal is to have a nice neutral wrist posture. Forearms should be parallel with elbows flexed. We don't want excessive radial or ulnar deviation for the patient. We um, want to avoid, like I said, that excessive radial or ulnar deviation. You may want to have an external pad here in order to place the mouse. And we also want to make sure that the arm is not resting on the surface like the picture in the top right here. So everything may be appropriate neutral wrist, but if the arm is resting on a hard surface, particularly like a desk or an edge of a chair or a keyboard, that's going to give isolated compressive force that can injure those tendons um, and other soft tissue structures and again, create a potential area of um, ischemia. So we need to be, be cautious of that. For our patient. So that individual who's resting on the keyboard, we may need to increase their seat height to get or to get their arms clear a little bit. Keyboard slope is something we were looking at with the gentleman. This is the same gentleman again. That keyboard slope is looking at this angle between the um, keyboard and the flat surface. We usually don't want that to be more than 15 degrees because it'll place the wrist in too much extension. So you're going to adjust that to keep the wrist in neutral. A lot of people think those little feet are on the keyboard for a reason, so let me pop up those feet, places them in wrist extension. Well, now they're in too much wrist extension, so what do they want to do? They want to raise their arm up to get to take you know, the pressure off, maybe they're starting to get some numbness and tingling from the carpal tunnel, or they're starting to get some discomfort in the wrist extensors. So they raise their chair up, raise their arms up. Now they shift the height of their computer screen. So now they're flexing to see their computer screen. Ripple effect. So again, you have to look at our patients and see where we can jump in first. Um, go for those glaring things that you know are off for them. This is where we get to that palm rest or wrist rest, um, either for the mouse or the keyboard as a possible tool to utilize. Jury is out on it, and I kept reading the research to look for a final answer, and there really isn't one. It is called a wrist rest because you're supposed to use it when you're resting, not to rest your hand on it while you're typing. And maybe just educating the patient on that will be beneficial. The idea is that if you're leaning on that, even though it's a gel 
type of surface that it still can lead to increased compressive force. So we can interfere with typing. We can actually put the wrist in too much flexion if it raises them up, encroaching on that carpal tunnel. So we need to be cautious of that. The patients where the, the information tends to say it may be beneficial is if someone has, let's say, like a ganglion cyst or a pathology where they need that cushioning um, to relieve contact pressure, it can be beneficial. If um, we do have a setup where we just can't get rid of that excessive wrist extension, maybe that keyboard is at the wrong height, so we can add that little wrist support to flex them a little more, but again, make sure they're utilizing appropriate rest breaks. What might be more effective for those individuals where you can't get the correct wrist and hand position is switching the type of keyboard that they utilize. And I have actually found for patients who have decreased dexterity or strength, either because of arthritis or maybe consider your patient with neurologic pathology that's going back to work or even for recreation, they're utilizing um, typing or it's right a part of our life we do everything electronically um, maybe they have a spinal cord injury stroke multiple sclerosis so neurologic pathology we can utilize a different shaped keyboard to control the positioning of the hands that may allow them to be more successful so we have here what's called like a split keyboard so it allows them to be a more of a neutral position in terms of radial and um, ulnar deviation this is a tented keyboard so it actually tents up so that the individual is in less pronation. And what you want to think about for patients is as we change the pronation supination, we're changing the length tension relationship of our wrist muscles. So think about this. If you um, put, extend your arms all the way out and pronate. I can't get myself on a good angle. There we go. So I'm extended all the way out and I'm pronated. Now, as I flex my elbow back, feel what happens to your amount of pronation. You should be finding that when you're extended out, you're in full pronation of 90 degrees. As you just extend back, you should probably find that you start to supinate a little bit. And again, biomechanically, we're not going to get into it, but that's what happens. So if we know in a sitting posture for a patient, whether it's because they're obese or because they have pathology, whatever the reason is, if they can't get full pronation when they're at that 90 or 110 degrees of elbow flexion, how are they going to get their fingers on the keyboard? They're going to excessively pronate. Well, think about it. If you just don't have the range of, if you have the range, you're going to use excessive muscle firing. If you just don't have that range, you're going to internally rotate your shoulders to get your fingers on your keyboard. What happened now? You're impinging and your right, feel your scapular spread increase. Now you're protracting the scapula, upper trap, levator stress, weakness of the rhomboids, ripple effect. So maybe changing the keyboard type for the patient is going to be necessary in order to um, give them options. Think about the mouse location. The mouse should be close enough to the body so that you're not fully extended. Um, you really don't want that shoulder abducted because they've definitely found that when the shoulder is out in abduction, particularly looking at office ergonomics, that EMG has shown increased firing of the upper trapezius. So the amount of abduction directly correlates to upper trapezius firing for stability. So we want to make sure those armrests width is adjusted, as well as where we put our mouse so that the person can reach it um, comfortably. When someone is holding the mouse, we want to make sure we don't have, again, excessive wrist extension or wrist flexion or radial owner deviation. It should just be a comfortable hold with the hand resting, OTs, right, in that neutral hand position. And we can adjust our mouse uh, distance from the individual in order to help achieve that. We can also change the type of mouse that's utilized. Um, what I have here is an ergonomic mouse. So when you look at it, it may be hard to tell on camera, but it has contours in here. So that when I hold this mouse, 
I can really grip it nice and comfortably and use my whole finger to kind of rest and click versus these little travel mice. And I have a small hand too. So picture this little travel mouse. When I put this in my hand, see where all the compressive force is? I almost have what here, a pincer grip on the mouse. And that is going to be too much excessive force, so it can lead to pathology. Also look at the thumb position for the individual. That is that leading to a potential dequera veins for them if they're utilizing the thumb a lot to press and squeeze. If someone has a large hand and their mouse is contacting in their palm, Again, they're resting on it. That's going to give excessive compressive far force and a pressure point in the palm. It's going to cause tissue ischemia and greater tension on all the tendons of those um, finger flexors. So that can lead to uh, tenosynovitis or not allow it for healing. So you need to look at the size and shape of the mouse. There are so many out there. And consider having your patient use keyboard shortcuts whenever they can. So when we're using keyboard shortcuts, um, here are just a couple of common ones. I said the control plus or minus for zooming in and out. Control C is going to um, look at using copy and pasting. Control V, escape. There are so many out there, you can Google them. Um, but those are going to allow the individual to decrease the use of the wrist and hand and allow them to more effectively um, you know, limit the stress on the carpal tunnel, the finger muscles, if they have a wrist and hand um, type of pathology. Looking at our desk itself, because we talked about the region of where that mouse should be placed, we're going to look at having specific um, work zones. So what this means is there's a, um, a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary, kind of like care, right? So we're looking at where we place our items for easy use. And our primary reach zone are going to be those particular items that we use most frequently. So that should be when our arms are rested in this great position now that we have set up for our patients. We're looking at allowing them to have, you know, about that distance when the elbows are resting at the side that they can reach just right in this kind of front area. So that's where you're going to have um, your mouse, your frequently used items like maybe your phone, if it's a stapler, a hole punch, if there's a heavy binder that someone uses a lot, keep that close because that keeps you with a shorter lever arm. So that's going to decrease the work effort of the shoulder and other muscles in order lifting and moving it. 
Next, we go to that secondary reach zone or that occasional work area. So that's the amount that is going to be if I just reached my arm out, how far I can get if I just reach my arm out, not requiring any trunk movement. So if I lift my arm up with my shoulder, so it'll be that area that I can reach comfortably in that region. So it'll be my less frequently utilized items will be placed there. And then beyond that arm's length space are going to be those areas that I really don't use very often. So that might be the things that I would actually get up and use my appropriate reaching technique for, I make it up and walk over to. And I found that if we go back to this uh, primary uh, work area, when I did a recent ergonomic assessment, setting up the workstation, you know, we come in with all these great ideas, right? And then we need to pull out our customer service side because we're like, oh, these are people and they may or may not want our feedback. <laughs> um, what's typically in this area? The family pictures, the little, um, you know, memento from the last trip to Disney, the, uh, you know, little, maybe the mirror and the hairbrush, and the makeup case and all the different little things that are not work related that we don't need that we have to reach past to get to our actual work equipment. So something to think about um, being gentle in suggesting shifting those items um, because that psychological piece, right? The reason I'm working is to pay for this great trip to Disney for my grandkids um, or whatever it may be. But bear that in mind that what's typically in this front work area is usually not our, our work related items. So once we shift things where they should be into the appropriate work zone, we adjust the seat, we adjust the keyboard, we may find that everything still isn't fitting the way it should. And sometimes it means, you know, making an adjustment to the chair, making an adjustment to the desk, and then saying, wait, I need to come back to the chair now and change something because it's like a trade, right? So you might find that you need to add a footrest if the feet are dangling and we need to uh, bring the individual up higher to the space, that's a great way of uh, changing, changing the height of things. Document holders are another useful piece of equipment that can be utilized. Um, I'd caution you though with document holders because remember we said our radius is about 30 degrees for looking um, at the, the left and right. So make sure that document holder isn't too far away that they're rotating to and from in order to read for it. The document holder should be at a uh, comfortable distance, kind of about the same height or just a gentle glance up and down from the screen. It should still be in that same field of vision for the individual. 
So overall, we want to get our individuals set up appropriately. Here, this lady has uh, all of her ergonomics in place. So we think our job is done, but it's not. There are definitely some of those other environmental factors that we want to consider in order to maximize our ergonomic assessment. And one of them is related to the office environment and the temperature. Not necessarily something that can always be controlled, but the individual can bring different clothing uh, to adjust for the heat. So we need to think about that temperature really does play a role. And if we have colder temperatures, it's going to decrease circulation, increase viscosity of our tissues. They're not going to respond as well. Our proprioception awareness may change. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if it's too hot, we know that muscles are going to fatigue more easily when they're nice and warm. We're going to inc have increased laxity of them. So more of a tendency to kind of fold into those um, awkward and unstable postures that lead to pathology. So typical temperature ranges, they say that the indoor temperature that's recommended during winter months is between 68 and 74 degrees. So 68 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit is a recommended comfortable work environment during winter months. And then during summer months, they say 73 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit is uh, to maximize our functioning and productivity. Humidity is something to really consider. And us, those of us in Florida, we get humidity, right? <laughs> Um, and those of you in the Midwest maybe understand the other end of, of not having any humidity in that dry air. When humidity is low, we tend to find that things dry out, right? They have less moisture in them. Well, this kind of, you know, accounts to our skin also. If we have um, less hydration because of less humidity in the air, we have drying of the skin. This is going to make it more difficult to grasp and lift papers and other objects. We tend to find that individuals increase their typing force because they're not sensing as well. So again, we talked about repetitive, small intensity movements could be just as traumatic. Um, we also find that combining that with a cold temperature then, increases the risk of that uh, tino, tenosynovitis. So we need to be um, cautious. The recommended humidity ranges are somewhere between 30 and 60% humidity is the range. Uh, and then you can vary that. I'd like you to consider individuals who bring in dehumidifiers because they feel that it's stuffy in their office. I recently had an instance to use a dehumidifier um, for personal purposes, nothing to do with ergonomics, but it got me thinking. Um, the dehumidifier running 24 hours a day, granted, it decreased the humidity in the room by 40% just overnight. Now, it was an industrial strength dehumidifier, but that's pretty significant. So think of your patient who maybe they're bringing in that dehumidifier into their office because they feel it's stuffy, but if they're sucking the humidity out and they have a wrist and hand pathology, now they may be creating an environment that's actually making their condition worse because of the low humidity level. So we need to be cautious of that and maybe ask some of those questions for them. If they have, have a dehumidifier in there, maybe let's have them shut it off for periods of time. Work task modification is something else to educate our patients on. We know that rest periods are necessary, right? We tell even our post-op total hip patients, don't sit for three hours. You need to get up and be moving. So our office workers need to take those micro breaks every you know, 30 minutes to two hours, just a couple of minutes in order to even do some stretching at, at their desk or their, their general location. It sounds simple to do these things like take breaks, avoid the clutter on the, the desks, um, avoid clutter on the desk. But how can any of these individuals in these images have proper ergonomics? And again, the mental piece and the productivity piece. So it's that ripple effect, those small things to let our patients become aware of so that they can appropriately set themselves up to utilize all these strategies we'll educate them on. What we're going to look at next are certain body regions and consider how we can um, modify the environment if the patient has complaints of discomfort or pathology in specific body regions. 
So if the patient is reporting neck discomfort, what we need to think is head position. So we know that the head weighs approximately 10 to 12 pounds, and there's this study is very interesting that I pulled this um, particular information from. Um, so they looked at the weight of the head compared to the amount of cervical flexion. So it assessed the muscle activity necessary and kind of the lever arm looking at the weight of the head. And what they found is we know, you know, neutral, 10 to 12 pounds, our body should be able to stabilize with appropriate alignment. But as we went in to cervical flexion, they found that as the head flexed forward, once it reached 30 degrees, that head weighed 40 pounds now. So it's more than, you know, tripled in its weight just by flexing to 30 degrees. So think about that person, even yourself, on that portable computer that you put on the plinth to do your documentation. You're past your 30 degrees. Think about that patient who, yes, maybe they wear high heels sometimes like I do, so they raise their chair height up, but they didn't account for their screen height. So now they're flexed down. So be aware that that cervical position really leads to altered neck position. So here's that gentleman that we looked at before when I caught him at a different time during the day. And look at this amount of cervical flexion that we have going on here so that he can look at the keyboard. So we definitely need some modification because we may have accounted for his low back pathology, but it really has now been traded for a potential cervical. So we need to make modifications to this work environment so that we don't have that excessive forward flexion leading to upper back pain. If the individual is complaining of the upper neck and back pain, you want to look at your monitor height, look at the lighting as well as what, you know, are they using glasses to read? Is their seat reclined too far back? So now they need to bring everything forward to see the keyboard, to see, sorry, to see the monitor. Um, and also be aware of your keyboard. So you want to pay attention and make sure that the keyboard isn't too far forward that they're trying to reach for it or too far back that they're reclining back so that they could be on the keyboard resting with their hands. Let's look at this lady again who uh, has multiple things going on. Um, if she's complaining of the neck and back pain, now you have a bunch of ideas of where, where to modify. Um, so we're going to look at, in addition to, right, you want to strengthen up those rhomboids, stretch that pec minor, must be a rock, right? <laughs> um, and that iliopsoas has got to be so tight. Uh, but in addition to all of that, so that our stretching remains effective and she's not in this shortened down posture, all the time. We are going to uh, look at modifying the seat height, the computer height, get that mouse in closer here. And it actually might even work for her to stay up on the desk once we raise the seat height and get her shifted and aligned appropriately. Remember I said the QWERTY part of the keyboard should be centered? Here's the QWERTY part of the keyboard. Where's the center of her body? Over here somewhere. That's no way near it. Even if you look at this compared to the computer, it's totally off to the side. So we need to think about too that what pieces of the equipment does the patient, ut patient utilize? So if the mouse is primarily how she's doing her work and not the keyboard, then I'm going to change my focus to having that mouse in the best position and educate her on how to move the keyboard in and out of the space as necessary. But if she's primarily typing, then if she was in a typing position, we have a whole other set of issues because she's going to be rotated like this to see the computer screen. So we need to be aware of all that. Neck pain, as I mentioned, we're going to look at centering that keyboard for the individual. Corner units are a nice option. So we have a good corner unit here. Gives you a lot more space to work with so that you can get it further away. Um, from the individual so that they can have that appropriate focal length and you can have enough space for their alignment. 
If someone presents with shoulder discomfort is where their primary pathology is evidencing itself, we're going to, as I said, we looked at that that shoulder abduction distance really correlated to EMG activity of the upper trap and the uh, cervical musculature, the levator, the semispinalis capitis, splenius capitis, all of those cervical muscles. Um, so what we need to think about is looking at our armrest height, look at the seat height, also to make sure that they are um, appropriately sitting, keyboard and position. Uh, think about someone who's an ultra, uh, ultrasound tech or uh, sonographer. We're going to look at if they tend to be positioned more out in abduction, they actually, the chairs are manufactured differently so that they can be in that position and still have good alignment. Uh, versus your person who's at a desk where maybe you have that little addition to the keyboard for the mouse. So they're aligned appropriately. Cubital tunnel, we've mentioned several times. This individual has way too much elbow flexion. That's not even accurate. This is more her elbow flexion here. Uh, elbow flexion, she's petite, so she's up there nice and close, but that cubital tunnel now is totally resting, and she's going to have ulnar nerve compression, numbness and tingling of the pinky, and then decreased um, innervation to those wrist and hand muscles, which will alter her force of contraction, effort, ripple effect again, right? So for her, we need to look at having her sit back on the chair, use the bat lumbar support, use the armrest, and probably raise her up so this keyboard isn't up so high. If the individual is complaining of back discomfort, as we mentioned, we're going to really look at that forward head positioning in order to uh, try and avoid that, checking at the seat distance, also look at the reclining of the seat might be an option for someone to utilize in order to decrease that loading on the spine. This individual is not, again, using his chair whatsoever. I went with uh, a very old school setup here. We may have individuals that are using standard chairs in their offices. So he needs to rotate this chair so he's facing front. We may have to add on a strap-on lumbar support for him in order to have alignment. We may need to look at you know, modifying equipment in different ways, maybe a towel roll to give that lumbar support. So we may not always have that fancy equipment in order to make our modifications. As I mentioned, looking at the clutter in the space that the individual um, is utilizing, so we're going to be aware that individuals, particularly someone who is larger in stature, if obesity um, is a diagnosis for them, and uh, research has actually shown that an alternative keyboard is going to be more beneficial for them in order to accommodate for that lack of pronation that they may have. So as I said, if you can't pronate to get on the keyboard, you're going to compensate elsewhere. So a domed keyboard, or a different type tented keyboard may not require as much pronation, so then they can be in a better position, relax the shoulders, and again, translate that to the entire chain. And what they found is, it, is if someone is sitting you know, back and they actually recline too far back in the chair, and I think someone mentioned this in the discussion, that after approximately 10 minutes of a um, static posture with excessive lumbar flexion, so you know, if we all were to slouch back and hang out here for 10 minutes, they've actually found that because of the uh, muscle creep that occurs and other protective spasms for the posture that may occur in other areas, that micro trauma starts to develop in the muscles, leading to um, inflammation, change in the collagen structures, and that's just after 10 minutes. It also may change the proprioceptive feedback, and it increases that anterior loading on the spine. So if the patient has a herniated disc or a bulging disc, we're increasing the potential of pathology for them. They're in that chair for a lot of time. Leg and back discomfort, you're going to look at your seat height. And then if someone has wrist and hand discomfort, you're going to look at all the keyboard setups that we've discussed, and you're going to look at the mouse. And I dated myself here. I wrote mouse ball. I don't know what I was thinking. Actually, I do. I wasn't, right? How long? Some of you are going, I don't even know what a mouse ball is. So, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> now we have these little lights, but clean them, the sensor under here, because make sure it moves freely. Make sure the mouse moves freely. Otherwise, that's more force that the individual needs to utilize. Think about a wireless keyboard, wireless mouse, because that'll make it easier for you to get um, the setup for the patient. And I know there are some questions coming through, and I promise I'll, I'll hit on them um, once we get get down to the end if I don't touch on the subject as we go through. Um, think about the different mouse, there's different types. If we think about the force that we utilize and the distance that we travel with the mouse, when we're using a mouse, if we just think about the amount of pressure that we are placing with our hand on the mouse, we have what's called mouse miles because we move the mouse to move it on the screen. And as we're moving our mouse, what research has shown is we're moving, and let me get the appropriate uh, number here for you. When we're moving that mouse, we're placing um, a stress on it and we're exerting about a pound of force every time that we go to um, click that mouse. And when we click the mouse, what we're finding is we do about one ounce of pressure every time we do a mouse click. And if we sustain that over 30 minutes and over time, if we were to add up you know, a day's worth of mouse clicks, it'd be, I think they said like 67, 670 pounds of force if we did it in one, one click. So every little mouse click over the course of day, if we asked our muscles to do that just in one shot, it'd be like 670 pounds of force. That's pretty significant. That's a lot of effort when you think about it in that, in that manner. So we want to be cautious of thinking about using maybe keystrokes. Look at the accessibility settings. You can change the sensitivity of the mouse so that it glides more easily. It takes a lot less effort. And this is great for the patients with, um, let's say, spinal cord injury and neurologic pathology. You can require more or less effort to move the mouse, change the sensitivity. You could change the left and right click on the mouse maybe alter it throughout the day for the individual to give them some relief for them. If you really need to change the sensitivity of the mouse, they have what's called gaming mice. And I actually went and looked at these and they're, they're pretty neat. Um, it's built into the mouse, the sensitivity level. So for every slight movement of the mouse on the surface, it will uh, move it further across the screen. So you can actually have your, you know, patient or client go to the store, try out the different mice and see which one requires, you know, a comfortable amount of effort for them to move. And sometimes I bought one that I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to increase the uh, CPI, the counts per inch. Well, I went to move it. I was actually co-contracting more to try and stabilize because the mouse was just flying all over the page. My proprioceptive uh, awareness wasn't in tune with it and kinesthesia. Uh, so bear in mind that we can, we can think about adjusting those things for um, our patients. What we want to think about is eye strain also. If our patient is going to wear contacts, eye strain, uh, we need to think about humidity. We also need to think about um, eye fatigue. Palming is something that you can teach your patient how to do where they're going to place just their palms gently over their eyes with their metacarpophalangeal uh, joints kind of rest on their eyebrows and hold that for about 20 seconds. They might feel immediate relief and that'll help decrease eye strain for them. Another technique that we can teach our patients is that they should incorporate a visual rest approximately every 20 minutes. So you're going to kind of pick two objects that are about um, 20 feet away, stare at one for 10 seconds, stare at the other 10 seconds, repeat that and come back. That'll help decrease the eye strain for the individual. So that might be another tip that'll be helpful. Polishes, polished surface look pretty, but they increase glare. So we want to uh, decrease those. And also glare is going to be um, increased with dust. Who knew, right? I would think in a you know, provide a haze, help decrease that glare, but actually it increases it. So we're going to um, look at minimizing the dust, do some cleaning in there, maybe to help decrease glare. In terms of postural variability, there's no one correct posture. So adjusting 
been changing between the um, you know the standing if that's an option sitting reclined 90 90 there's no one position that's particularly recommended that reclined sitting posture can be beneficial for the patient in order to um, give them some eye relief but again want to make sure that they are not reclined back too far this is a good position the recline to tell them when they're on the phone or when they're engaging in conversation to give them some relief as opposed to when they are sitting so the decline too, where the front end of the chair is angled down a little might reduce lumbar strain for some patients. In terms of patient education, I'm just going to hit on the two questions that came up because it kind of ties in with this. If a patient is um, looking at the positioning of their keyboard because we educate them in these different self-assessment tools, I have a couple of links up here. So we're gonna have them do some modifications on their own. So the question came up, uh, you know, where would we place the keyboard for someone who's right-handed versus left-handed? And the tool would be the same. So we wanna have it so that their arms are relaxed and centered. We're looking at the amount of pronation and elbow flexion. So for that individual, you're going to position the keyboard so the part that they maximally utilized is centered for them. In terms of seating, as we mentioned, there's a different seating postures and standard seating, and there are some newer things that come out for TheraBalls and things like that. As with anything new that comes out, you're going to assess your patient's ability to be safe and stable in it and see if it really achieves the goals that you intended. So it's going to be really uh, general for them. I haven't seen any specific research on it yet. Be aware that when you're educating the patient that you're going to look at that uh, somatization tendency and how the negative thoughts may come into play. So just arming them with all this information may be helpful or giving them some uh, little facts might be, be beneficial to help them modify and empower themselves in adjusting their environment. And then we're going to tie that in with our patient education in order to have them stretching, encourage them to take advantage of any additional resources that might be available through their employers for general health and wellness that can overall contribute to decreased risk or increased recovery from musculoskeletal disorders. And then we're going to look as clinicians at incorporating all of these ideas for our patients into their rehab because they are spending much more time at their home or their work environment than they are with us. So we want to make sure that we have that carryover so that our stretching strengthening programs are effective for them. So hopefully this uh, presentation has given you some uh, good ideas of ways to modify for your patients and think about adjusting the work environment to be more effective for them. What we're going to do next, uh, here's the one statistic that I didn't mention that I wanted to tell you about um, 
the pounds of weight. Uh, so that one ounce of pressure that we apply for one second over the course of a workday comes out to 6,700 pounds of force. Uh, if we did it in one click, three tons of mouse grip a day, and that's 750 tons of mouse grip every year. So uh, something we definitely want to look at uh, modifying for our patients. Uh, so, Daniel, you were asking about what's high perceived exertion, and I, let me just flip back. I believe that's on the slide when we were talking about the psychological factors. Yes, okay. Perceived exertion, kind of thinking like the Borg scale, um, where an individual is giving you their perception of how hard their job is and how hard they are physically having to work. So, um, it's not looking at the mental piece as much, um, it contributes to it, but it's looking at, you know, well, I really feel like I physically am putting a lot of effort or having to work very hard at this job. So that's what it means by perceived exertion. And Yasmin, that's definitely a good point um, that for the individual, they are likely to fatigue over the course of a day that may change their positioning. Ideally, or theoretically, I should say, once we look at how the office environment is set up, if the principles are employed, theoretically, if the workstation puts the individual in the right ergonomic posture, they should be able to sustain that over the course of the day because it will not induce as much fatigue, substitutions, and compensations. Similar to our back patients that once we teach them proper alignment and core stability, that they're able to maintain that neutral spine and not place um, pressure on that herniated disc. Theoretically, if you do find for your patient that it becomes an issue, by all means, I, I would consider utilizing the tool and assessing them at different times during the day. So Kathy, right, there were a couple of small studies that looked at utilizing pictures and the video type, like what we're doing, um, assessments, that did show it can be effective. I would think, you know, we need to consider that based on the patient and the tools and things like that available. But I think you can see just from the images that I did, kind of like those drop-ins, that even a still picture can give you a lot of information. And then maybe you have the opportunity to simulate some of those things or look at the education that that can occur so um, that might be something that you can consider utilizing and again there are some larger companies that utilize the remote assessments that's a good question um Kyosha, in terms of who can administer these assessments you know the tools are out there, I would think it comes down to scope of practice and in terms of your access, first access to the patient, are you able to um, provide services to them? Are you billing for those services? So you need, would need to check with your um, professional regulation, state, local, federal guidelines in terms of that. In terms of just the use of the tools, I haven't come across anything that say they're discipline specific, the tools just exist and then it would depend if it's I would think within scope of practice for the individual. Same thing, Daniel, with that spinal loading, we really need to educate our patients that if they recline too far, you're actually increasing the spinal loading. Uh, and that's something that I'll mention too in our, in our last session, we'll talk about more of what's going on there related to proprioception. Yasmin, true? Right, we have to look at our um, f our visual acuity for our patients and see are they even using the eyewear that has been prescribed to them? What is the lighting? All those other factors that come into play. And sometimes it's something as simple as that that may be your starting point for your patient. So based on the pathology that we're seeing them for, we may consider if it's a head and neck pathology or migraines, we, our first questions may be about glasses and visual strain and things like that. So all, all good discussion, I appreciate it. 